In an era where our lives unfold through screens and our connections are measured in clicks, Dale Carnegie's classic guide, How to Win Friends and Influence People in the Digital Age, emerges as a beacon of timeless wisdom amidst the digital cacophony. Imagine Carnegie, with his knack for understanding human nature, stepping into the virtual realm where tweets, likes, and emojis dictate our daily interactions. Here, his principles of empathy, sincerity, and understanding morph into digital avatars, guiding us through the complexities of online relationships. This isn't just a book about networking or self-promotion. It's a manifesto for navigating the digital landscape with integrity and purpose. Carnegie's insights, now reinterpreted for the age of algorithms and influencers, remind us that behind every avatar is a person craving connection and validation. From crafting compelling emails that resonate beyond the inbox to mastering the art of engaging through virtual platforms, Carnegie's teachings offer a roadmap for cultivating meaningful digital relationships. In a world where attention is the new currency, his emphasis on genuine interest in others and the power of listening stands out as a testament to the enduring value of human connection. As you delve into this digital adaptation, prepare to uncover strategies that transcend fleeting trends and fleeting likes. Carnegie's principles are not just about amassing followers, but about forging lasting impressions and building a network based on trust and mutual respect. So, whether you're a social media maven or a digital novice, how to Win Friends and Influence People in the Digital Age serves as a guidebook for harnessing the potential of digital communication while staying true to the core principles of authentic human interaction. It's more than just adapting to technology. It's about using it as a tool to amplify our ability to connect, influence, and ultimately make a positive impact in the digital realm and beyond. Why Carnegie's Advice Still Matters in 1936, Dale Carnegie made a compelling statement to his readers. Dealing with people is probably the biggest problem you face. This foundational insight from how to win friends and influence people is as relevant today as it was when first published. Despite the evolution in communication technology and the proliferation of media channels, the core principles Carnegie espoused continue to hold significant value. The rapid pace of messaging and the variety of communication platforms have expanded our networks beyond geographical, industrial, and ideological boundaries. This complexity only heightens the relevance of Carnegie's principles, making them the bedrock of any effective communication strategy. Whether marketing a brand, apologizing to a loved one, or pitching to investors, beginning with the right foundation is crucial. Missteps in communication can lead to misunderstandings, offense, or failure to achieve objectives. American writer James Thurber once emphasized the importance of precision in communication, noting that a misunderstood word can create as much disaster as a thoughtless act. In our current era, characterized by heightened scrutiny of every interaction, this precision is more critical than ever. Every word and nonverbal cue is subject to intense examination and a single misstep can have significant repercussions. Daily interactions offer countless opportunities to positively influence others. Success in these interactions requires more than just ad savvy or social media proficiency. As presidential speechwriter James Humes noted, the art of communication is the language of leadership. Effective people skills involve genuine interest in others, authentic engagement, and a foundation of trust and generosity. This approach builds lasting influence, whether on a small scale with a few individuals or a larger scale with a broader audience. Carnegie's principles remain vital because they focus on creating meaningful connections and fostering genuine respect, empathy, and grace. For instance, principles like not criticizing, condemning, or complaining, talking about others' interests, and admitting when you're wrong promote honest and respectful interactions. These principles guide individuals toward becoming kinder and more effective communicators, ultimately leading to richer relationships and more trustworthy transactions. In an age where superficial connections and self-promotion are rampant, Carnegie's advice offers a path to genuine, sustainable influence. His principles are not about manipulating others for personal gain, but about fostering authentic relationships based on mutual respect and understanding.
this approach leads to more meaningful and impactful interactions, whether in personal or professional settings. Furthermore, the rise of digital communication has not diminished the importance of Carnegie's principles. Despite the convenience of emails, texts, and social media, the essence of human connection remains unchanged. Authenticity, empathy, and genuine interest in others are still paramount. Carnegie's advice helps navigate the complexities of modern communication by emphasizing the importance of meaningful, altruistic interactions over superficial engagements. In summary, Dale Carnegie's advice continues to be relevant in today's fast-paced, digitally driven world. His timeless principles provide a foundation for effective communication, fostering genuine connections, and building lasting influence. By prioritizing empathy, respect, and authenticity, individuals can navigate the complexities of modern interactions and achieve meaningful success in their personal and professional lives. Affirm What's Good, a professional exploration in the Academy Award-winning film, The King's Speech, we witness the transformative journey of Prince Albert, Duke of York, who overcomes a debilitating stammer with the help of Lionel Logue, an unorthodox Australian speech therapist. This poignant narrative is more than just a tale of overcoming a speech impediment. It exemplifies the profound impact of affirming what's good in others. Prince Albert, affectionately known as Bertie, struggles with stammering, which severely affects his ability to communicate publicly and in intimate settings. Enter Lionel Logue, whose innovative approach to speech therapy views stammering as both a psychological and physical issue. Despite initial resistance, Bertie finds in Logue an ally who sees beyond his speech disorder, recognizing his inherent courage and potential. This relationship climaxes as Bertie, soon to be King George VI, confronts his fears spurred by Logue's heartfelt affirmation of his bravery. This story illustrates a critical principle, the transformative power of affirming the good in others. Logue's influence on Bertie underscores the idea that recognizing and reinforcing positive qualities can lead to profound personal change. This principle extends beyond historical narratives to, to contemporary leadership and everyday interactions. Contrast this with the actions of Ron Schiller, a former NPR executive, whose disparaging remarks about political groups starkly differ from Logue's constructive approach. While both Logue and Schiller had opportunities to influence, only Logue chose a path that upheld human dignity and potential. Schiller's critical stance did not foster positive change, whereas Logue's affirmations enabled Bertie to rise above his perceived limitations. The importance of this principle is further illustrated in a powerful parable about a shepherd who leaves 99 sheep to find the one that is lost. This story highlights the value of each individual and the lengths to which one should go to affirm their worth. This level of affirmation conveys a deep sense of value to all, fostering a culture of care and respect. In our modern, fast-paced world, filled with superficial engagements and fleeting interactions, genuine affirmation stands out as a potent tool for building meaningful connections. While it's easy to acknowledge trivial achievements, such as a neighbor's new purchase, truly impactful affirmation requires recognizing and valuing the deeper qualities and potential in others. This distinction is crucial. Genuine concern and understanding differentiate meaningful affirmation from mere flattery. Anecdotes from figures like Muhammad Ali, who advised a young student with humor and insight, demonstrate how affirmation, grounded in genuine concern, can guide individuals toward fulfilling their potential. Affirmation demands seeing and knowing people well enough to recognize what truly matters to them, thus fostering trust and genuine connection. Renowned author Rick Warren emphasizes the importance of treating people not as projects to be molded, but as lives to be unfolded. This perspective aligns with the idea that leaders should nurture the innate potential within others, thus creating environments where individuals can thrive. The story of President Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address serves as a historical testament to the power of affirmation. At a time of deep national division, Lincoln appealed to the shared values and history of the nation, urging reconciliation and unity. His words, Affirming what was good amidst discord helped to bridge a divide and set the stage for healing and progress.
Similarly, in the corporate world, Ed Fuller, president of Marriott International, recounts how respect and personal connection helped resolve a volatile business dispute. By taking the time to understand and affirm the opposing party's values and commitments, Fuller transformed a contentious relationship into a cooperative one. The principle of affirming the good is timeless and universally applicable, transcending contexts from personal relationships to professional environments. It involves recognizing and valuing the positive aspects in others, thus fostering mutual respect and influencing positive change. Whether through face-to-face -face interactions or digital communications, the ability to affirm and value others authentically can bridge gaps, resolve conflicts, and build lasting connections. Ultimately, affirming the good in others is about more than just influence. It is about creating a culture of respect, dignity, and potential. It is a principle that, when applied consistently, can lead to profound and lasting impacts on individuals and communities alike. Connect with core desires. In early 2002, Apple introduced a distinctive new computer, the iMac, featured on the cover of Time. Its innovative design, characterized by a domed base and a flexible chrome neck attached to a flat screen monitor, allowed effortless adjustments with a mere touch. Apple, then on the brink of collapse, needed this product to succeed. Apple's core user base had traditionally consisted of creative, non-conformist individuals. However, in the cover story, Apple's CEO, Steve Jobs, articulated a visionary strategy for consumers, the personal computer as a digital hub for integrating camcorders, digital cameras, MP3 players, PDAs, cell phones, and DVD players. Along with the iMac, Apple introduced iTunes, iPhoto, and iMovie, software that would become integral to the digital era. Despite skepticism and ridicule from critics and competitors, the public embraced Jobs' vision, and Apple's market value soared by 4,856%, dwarfing the 14% rise of its nearest competitor. Understanding Influence – Core Desires The reason behind Apple's unprecedented success lies in a principle championed by Dale Carnegie, to influence others, you must connect with their core desires. This principle is universal, as illustrated by a famous story involving Ralph Waldo Emerson and his son attempting to coax a calf into a barn. Despite their efforts, the calf resisted until their housemaid gently led it with her finger in its mouth, appealing to its desire for food. This anecdote underscores two crucial insights into influence. One, intuition over intellect. Influence requires understanding and responding to the core desires of others rather than relying solely on intellectual prowess. Steve Jobs, success stemmed from his deep understanding of what people wanted, a consolidated digital life, rather than just his technical knowledge. This principle is echoed by Guy Kawasaki, who highlighted the importance of a deep relationship with people for effective influence. Two, gentleness in approach. Effective influence often involves subtlety and a gentle approach. This is embodied by the housemaid's method of leading the calf, contrasted with the forceful attempts by Emerson and his son. Dwight Eisenhower exemplified this with his mantra, gently in manner, strong in deed, reflecting his global influence through a considerate approach. Applying influence across contexts. The practice of connecting with core desires is crucial across all sectors. Successful interactions whether in business, personal relationships, or artistic endeavors, hinge on understanding and addressing the true needs and wants of others. This principle is particularly relevant in sales, where success relies on dialogue and genuine conversation rather than persuasive monologues. Todd Duncan, in Killing the Sale, emphasizes the importance of engaging in meaningful dialogue to establish trust and meet the needs of clients. Real conversation, as Dr. Theodore Zeldin notes, catches fire and fosters genuine connections, shifting from broadcasting to connecting. Despite the substantial investment in branding and marketing, many efforts fall short because they focus more on the messenger's desires than the recipient's core needs. The key to effective influence lies in reversing this approach. Prioritize connecting over campaigning. An honest assessment of your impact can reveal whether you truly connect with core desires. David Shainer, in The Seven Arts of Change, asserts that lasting transformation begins with connecting to the fundamental desires of individuals, a principle that has guided successful organizational changes in major corporations.
case study, a secretary's revelation. A former U.S. Secretary of Education realized the importance of connecting with core desires after a year of ineffective, albeit visible, leadership. His wife suggested that he engage directly with the field, visiting schools and interacting with students and teachers to reignite passion within the Department of Education. This hands-on approach, focusing on the core desire for meaningful work, transformed the department's morale and effectiveness. Conclusion, influence through connection. In a world dominated by one-way digital communication, the ability to connect with core desires offers a significant advantage. Influence is not about outsmarting others, but about understanding and addressing their deepest wants. Whether in corporate emails, social media, or personal interactions, shifting from a monologue to a dialogue approach fosters genuine connections and effective influence. Steve Jobs' vision in 2002 demonstrated that understanding and addressing core desires could transform an industry and propel a company to unprecedented success. This principle, applied universally, can lead to profound influence and positive change. Taking an interest in others' interests is an essential principle for fostering meaningful relationships and achieving success in both personal and professional spheres. This concept goes beyond the superficial and taps into the core of human interaction, emphasizing the importance of genuine curiosity and empathy. When exploring the best way to win friends, one might consider looking to influential figures, such as top social media personalities, savvy salespeople, or powerful politicians. However, these individuals might not always be the most suitable role models. Instead, we could learn from the loyalty and enthusiasm of dogs, often celebrated as man's best friend for their unwavering devotion and joy in human company. This instinctive behavior demonstrates a key principle. Showing genuine interest in others can create stronger, more lasting bonds. Historically, Human self-interest has been a prominent theme even before the advent of modern technology. For instance, a study by the New York Telephone Company in the 1930s revealed that the word I was the most frequently used in telephone conversations, highlighting our inherent self-focus. This self-centeredness can be seen in timeless fables and stories where characters like Icarus, Peter Rabbit, and Adam and Eve act out of personal interest, often leading to their downfall. The Austrian psychotherapist Alfred Adler stated that individuals who are not interested in others often face the greatest difficulties and cause the most harm. This perspective is supported by examples of major human failures, such as the collapse of Lehman Brothers or the actions of corrupt officials and athletes, which stem from a lack of consideration for others. On a smaller scale, self-interest can lead to a lack of true friendships and meaningful connections. In contrast, Taking an interest in others' interests fosters deeper connections and trust, ultimately leading to greater influence. This principle does not require complete self-denial, but rather encourages incorporating others' interests into one's own. For example, author Anne Rice has built a strong relationship with her readers by responding personally to their letters and engaging with them on social media. Successful individuals in various fields have demonstrated the power of this approach. Steve Beecham, a business owner, transformed his career by focusing on building relationships rather than solely pursuing business deals. He became known as a helpful and trustworthy resource in his community, leading to a thriving, referral-based business. The principle of taking an interest in others is also evident in the sports world. Amy Martin, a social media expert, highlighted how NASCAR's fan engagement strategy creates genuine connections and loyalty. By providing fans with access and interaction opportunities, NASCAR fosters a strong sense of community and influence. In today's digital age, the potential for relational connectivity is immense. Showing genuine interest in others can significantly enhance personal and professional relationships. As leadership expert John Maxwell noted, people prefer to do business with those they like. And likability often stems from showing interest in others. By shifting focus from self-promotion to engaging with and understanding others, one can build stronger, more meaningful connections. Whether through personal interactions or digital engagement, 
taking an interest in others' interests can lead to mutual benefits and collaborative success. This approach not only enhances individual relationships, but can A smile, though seemingly simple, holds profound significance in human interaction. Amidst the cacophony of disagreements and divergent beliefs that characterize our world, it stands as a universal connector. Surveys indicate that while consensus on many topics eludes us, nearly all adults across various cultures and societies recognize the importance of a smile as a social asset. Reflecting on the most viewed videos on platforms like YouTube, it becomes evident that smiles captivate us. Whether it's the infectious laughter of a baby or the playful interaction between siblings, these moments of genuine joy resonate deeply with viewers, transcending cultural boundaries. Indeed, the impact of a smile extends beyond mere amusement. It serves as a powerful tool for bonding and communication from the earliest stages of human development. Even in settings as solemn as courtrooms, the smile leniency effect influences judgments, underscoring the subtle yet profound influence of a smile on interpersonal dynamics. Research conducted by scholars such as Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler further illuminates the ripple effect of happiness within social networks, demonstrating how one person's smile can resonate through multiple degrees of separation, fostering clusters of positivity within communities. In an increasingly digital age, where face-to-face -face interactions are supplanted by emails, texts, and social media posts, the significance of conveying warmth and goodwill through written communication cannot be overstated. While traditional emoticons and modern emojis offer some means of expressing emotion, they may not always suffice in professional contexts. Thus, Mastering the art of infusing written messages with positivity and sincerity becomes essential for effective communication across digital platforms. Similarly, the tone and inflection of spoken words play a pivotal role in conveying emotions, even in phone conversations where facial expressions are absent. Studies suggest that smiling while speaking enhances the perceived warmth and sincerity of one's voice, reinforcing the notion that a smile transcends physical presence. As technology advances, innovations in effective computing hint at a future where machines can interpret and respond to human emotions. Yet, it is crucial to remember that the essence of human connection lies in genuine empathy and understanding, qualities that a smile embodies effortlessly. Ultimately, a smile serves as a silent yet potent instrument of goodwill, capable of bridging divides and uplifting spirits in both personal and professional interactions. In a world often beset by discord and discordance, its enduring power to enrich lives and forge connections remains unrivaled. So, let us remember to smile, for in doing so, we enrich not only our own lives, but also the lives of those around us. Rain with Names delves into the profound significance of names in various contexts, ranging from personal identity to professional success. Through anecdotes and historical examples, the text illustrates how names serve as more than mere labels, embodying deeper meanings and connections. The narrative begins with the groundbreaking appointment of Kathleen Sullivan as a named partner in a prestigious law firm, highlighting the rarity of such recognition for women in the legal profession. This event marks a significant milestone, symbolizing the breaking down of barriers and the acknowledgement of diverse talent. Drawing on literary and cultural references, the text emphasizes the intrinsic value of names throughout history, underscoring their role in shaping identity, character, and destiny. From ancient civilizations to modern societies, names hold symbolic power and carry profound implications. Furthermore, the narrative explores the commercial significance of names in the digital age, where personal branding and recognition are paramount. Through examples like Reed Drummond's transformation into the pioneer woman and Dave Munson's personalized approach with saddleback leather, the text illustrates how names can translate into economic value and success. Moreover, the text emphasizes the importance of remembering and using others' names as a form of respect and connection building. By citing anecdotes such as the impact of a waiter remembering a customer's name, or a physician adopting a first-name basis with patients, it underscores how names can foster meaningful relationships and enhance professional interactions. Ultimately, Rain with Names, 
advocates for the acknowledgement of the inherent significance of significance of names in both personal and professional spheres, emphasizing their role in fostering connections, building rapport, and achieving success. Listen longer, the key to success. How do you secure a job, land a client, enhance your influence, and avoid a significant financial loss? The answer is simple, listen. In March 2008, members of a little-known Canadian indie band were en route to Nebraska for a week-long tour. Their journey included a layover in Chicago, where they witnessed their guitars being carelessly tossed around by United Airlines baggage handlers. One of those guitars, a $3,500 Taylor, belonged to lead singer Dave Carroll. Despite his immediate attempts to inform United staff, his concerns were repeatedly dismissed. Carol's year-long struggle to get United Airlines to address the damage culminated in the creation of the song United Breaks Guitars. Uploaded to YouTube on July 6, 2009, the video quickly went viral, amassing nearly 4 million views in just two weeks. The resulting negative publicity led to a 10% drop in United Airlines stock price, costing shareholders $180 million. This incident underscores the critical importance of listening to customers. The power of listening extends beyond customer service. It is essential for building trust and lasting relationships, both personally and professionally. CSMIC founder Loic Lemur advocates for long-term engagement programs that facilitate listening to customers rather than relying solely on online ad campaigns. Historical figures like Abraham Lincoln and Sigmund Freud exemplified the transformative power of listening. Lincoln, during the Civil War, often sought a sympathetic ear to unburden his thoughts, while Freud was renowned for his extraordinary attentiveness. Modern research highlights a troubling trend. People are becoming more socially isolated, with fewer close confidants than in previous decades. Despite having vast online networks, meaningful conversations are dwindling. Listening is a skill that can and should be cultivated. Presence is key being fully engaged and attentive in every interaction. John, an aspiring political writer, attributes his successful job interviews to his ability to listen deeply and ask thoughtful questions. Ultimately, listening fosters respect, builds connections, and can prevent costly misunderstandings. Companies like Taylor Guitars recognize this as evidenced by their response to Carol's plight. United Airlines, on the other hand, learned the hard way that failing to listen can have significant repercussions. In conclusion, listening is not just a courtesy, it is a powerful tool for personal and professional success. By truly hearing and valuing others, we can create more harmonious and effective relationships. The principle of discuss what matters to them is paramount in effective communication, both in personal and professional contexts. This concept underscores the importance of engaging others by focusing on their interests, needs, and perspectives, rather than merely projecting one's own thoughts and priorities. A quintessential illustration of this principle can be drawn from a dinner party anecdote involving George Bernard Shaw. Shaw, exasperated by a young man's incessant monologue, quipped that between the two of them, they knew everything in the world. The young man knew everything except that he was a bore and Shaw knew that he was a bore. This encounter highlights the significance of self-awareness and the impact of one-sided communication. In today's world, communication often revolves around self-promotion and personal narratives, akin to digital advertisements waiting for engagement. This approach is inherently passive, relying on others to take the initiative to connect. True relational dialogue, however, requires a shift from assumption to assimilation where understanding and addressing what matters to others takes precedence. Historically, this concept can be seen in the interaction between General William Henry Harrison and Native American Chief Tecumseh in 1810. Harrison's attempt to impose his cultural norms by offering a chair was rebuffed by Tecumseh, who valued his own traditions and perspectives more highly. This underscores the importance of respecting and integrating others' viewpoints in meaningful communication. In the realm of business and personal relationships, focusing on what matters to others is not just a courtesy, but a strategic necessity. Effective customer relationship management, as noted by blogger Doc Searles, should prioritize the customer's needs rather than just managing interactions. 
This customer-centric approach fosters genuine influence and long-lasting connections. Valeria Maltoni, a business strategist, emphasizes that true influence derives from engaging with shared interests and building communities. This requires identifying relevant areas for your audience and allowing them to amplify your influence through meaningful interactions. Similarly, Charlene Lee, in her book Open Leadership, warns against the superficial influence of social media, advocating instead for deeper, more committed relationships. The essence of long-term success lies in building trust-based relationships by consistently conveying value. Jason's experience in Senegal exemplifies this. By listening and understanding the villagers' perspectives, he built a meaningful connection that transcended cultural barriers. In our digital age, the distinction between followers and friends becomes crucial. While social media platforms may inflate the number of our connections, true influence is cultivated through meaningful relationships. According to Mitch Joel, true influence is about nurturing these relationships and adding real value to others' lives. Ultimately, being meaningful to others requires a dedicated effort to understand and prioritize their interests. This not only enhances personal and professional relationships, but also ensures that your communications resonate and make a lasting impact. The concept of leave others a little better emphasizes the significance of making small, positive impacts on people's lives. This principle, highlighted through a story shared by Steve Scanlon, a building champions business coach, revolves around everyday interactions and their profound cumulative effects. Scanlon narrates an experience with a cab driver named Mike who went out of his way to return Scanlon's lost phone. This simple act of kindness transformed what could have been a distressing situation into a memorable and positive experience. Scanlon coins this as small picture thinking underscoring the importance of focusing on small, meaningful actions rather than always chasing grand, overarching goals. In business, this philosophy can drastically influence outcomes. Scanlon provides an example of a sales manager at Macy's who initially focused on big picture targets, leading to a decrease in sales. By shifting focus to small, considerate actions towards customers, the manager later achieved significantly better results. This shift from big picture obsession to valuing small daily interactions exemplifies how modest, consistent efforts can lead to substantial progress. This principle extends beyond business. It applies universally to relationships, collaborations, and personal interactions. Renowned peak performance coach Tony Robbins emphasizes moving relationships from manipulative to meaningful by consistently adding value. In our digital age, where superficial connections are rampant, genuinely leaving others a little better stands out and builds lasting, impactful relationships. Historically, the golden rule, treat others as you wish to be treated, has been a guiding principle across cultures and philosophies. This timeless wisdom aligns with the idea of leaving others better, suggesting that small acts of kindness and consideration create a foundation for meaningful human connections. In conclusion, while big picture thinking has its place, it's the small intentional actions that often make the most significant difference. By focusing on these, we can consistently leave others a little better, creating a ripple effect of positivity and fostering deeper, more meaningful relationships in all areas of life. Avoid arguments, a professional approach. The principle of avoiding arguments is not merely a tactic for maintaining peace, but a foundational strategy for building trust, fostering collaboration, and ensuring long-term success. The story of Reverend Billy Graham, as detailed in The Preacher and the Presidents by Nancy Gibbs and Michael Duffy, illustrates this concept poignantly. Graham's interaction with a prominent critic, William Connor, demonstrates the effectiveness of choosing grace and goodwill over confrontation. By meeting Connor in person and engaging him with respect and sincerity, Graham transformed a skeptic into an admirer. This approach underscores a vital lesson. Arguments seldom lead to changed minds, while respectful dialogue can. Humorist Dave Barry humorously highlights the futility of arguments, noting that winning an argument often isolates individuals rather than fostering respect and connection. 
This observation is particularly relevant in today's digital age, where online discourse frequently devolves into unproductive bickering. The anonymity and distance provided by digital platforms often lead to a lack of accountability, resulting in arguments that are more about scoring points than resolving issues. The case of former BP chief executive Tony Hayward during the Deepwater Horizon crisis exemplifies the dangers of a defensive and argumentative stance. Hayward's dismissive comments and refusal to acknowledge the severity of the situation alienated the public and eroded trust. His approach, focused on self-exoneration rather than empathy and responsibility, had disastrous consequences for both his reputation and BP's brand. This incident reinforces the idea that in matters of public perception and human relations, arguments can be particularly damaging. Conversely, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva's tenure as president of Brazil illustrates the power of negotiation and collaboration. Lula's ability to build alliances across political and economic divides enabled him to achieve significant social and economic reforms. His philosophy of avoiding conflict and prioritizing dialogue and cooperation demonstrates how this approach can lead to remarkable accomplishments, even in the face of substantial challenges. Corporate behavioral specialist Esther Jealous emphasizes that effective communication is not merely about delivering a message, but about genuinely listening and valuing others' perspectives. By recognizing that everyone has valuable insights and wisdom, we can create a collaborative environment where mutual understanding and respect flourish. This approach leads to better interpersonal outcomes and fosters a culture of shared growth and innovation. In conclusion, avoiding arguments is a strategic choice that enhances personal and professional relationships. By prioritizing respectful dialogue, empathy, and collaboration, individuals and organizations can achieve greater success and create a more harmonious and productive environment. This principle, rooted in humility, never say you're wrong. In professional and personal interactions, declaring someone else as wrong is often counterproductive and can lead to unnecessary conflicts. A more nuanced approach fosters understanding, collaboration, and positive outcomes. Recognizing the complexities of disputes, Deepak Malhotra, a Harvard Business School professor and co-author of Negotiation Genius, highlights the pitfalls of the I'm right, you're wrong mentality through the example of sports disputes. In both the 2011 NFL revenue share dispute and the 2004-05 NHL dispute, owners and players failed to recognize each other's legitimate concerns, leading to significant financial losses and damaged relationships. Malhotra emphasizes that productive negotiations require acknowledging the validity of the other party's concerns, suggesting that viewing opponents as mistrusting rather than greedy could have led to more effective resolutions. The value of nuance in disagreements. Mahatma Gandhi once said, friendship that insists upon agreement on all matters is not worth the name. Differences in opinion should be seen as small cracks in the sidewalk easily negotiable with an open mind. Recognizing and respecting subtle differences can transform potential conflicts into opportunities for growth and collaboration. The trap of assumed knowledge. Corporate behavioral specialist Esther Jealous points out that the expectation to demonstrate knowledge often hinders open-minded interactions. Approaching conversations with a blank slate ready to listen and learn enables meaningful collaboration. This mindset shift helps avoid the pitfall of seeking corroboration and rebuttal rather than understanding and partnership. A case study in effective mediation. Jealous recounts a mediation experience with a media conglomerate following Hurricane Katrina. By shifting the focus from defending positions to considering how each department could have supported others, Jealous facilitated a breakthrough in collaboration and mutual understanding. This approach highlights the importance of asking constructive questions and recognizing the essential roles of different perspectives. Historical example of collaborative success. The Human Genome Project, led by Dr. Francis Collins, exemplifies the power of cooperation over competition. Despite the rivalry with Craig Venter, Collins chose to acknowledge Venter's contributions positively, fostering a collaborative spirit that advanced the project. This demonstrates that viewing differences as complementary rather than oppositional can lead to groundbreaking achievements. 
avoiding the pitfall of proving others wrong. Dale Carnegie's anecdote from a post-World War I banquet illustrates the futility of insisting on proving someone wrong. Carnegie's friend, despite knowing the correct source of a quote, chose not to correct the storyteller, prioritizing harmony over correctness. This lesson underscores the importance of maintaining respectful and non-confrontational interactions to build positive relationships. Diplomacy in Communication In today's digital age, the tone of online communication can inadvertently convey judgment. Ensuring a respectful and conciliatory tone, whether in person or online, is crucial. This approach not only preserves relationships, but also opens the door to unexpected collaboration and positive results. Always default to diplomacy, admit the possibility of being wrong, and strive to understand the other person's perspective. By embracing these principles, individuals and organizations can foster environments where collaborative problem-solving thrives, leading to more innovative and mutually beneficial outcomes. Admitting faults quickly and emphatically isn't just a noble virtue. It can transform a moment of failure into an opportunity for redemption and grace. Let's dive into some iconic stories where quick admissions turned potential disasters into celebrated examples of sportsmanship and integrity. Consider the infamous Hand of God goal during the 1986 World Cup quarterfinals. Argentina's Diego Maradona used his hand to score a goal against England, a blatant violation missed by referee Ali bin Nasser. The controversy still echoes in football lore, highlighting how errors can linger when left unaddressed. Another memorable incident occurred in the 1996 American League Championship Series. Jeffrey Mayer, a 12-year-old fan, interfered with a fly ball, leading umpire Rich Garcia to mistakenly call it a home run. The New York Yankees benefited, much to the Baltimore Orioles' detriment. These errors, while unforgettable, might have faded had the officials owned up to their mistakes right away. But one of the most poignant examples comes from Major League Baseball. Detroit Tigers pitcher Armando Galarraga was on the brink of pitching a perfect game in 2010. With two outs in the ninth inning, he fielded a ground ball and beat the runner to first base, only for umpire Jim Joyce to call the runner safe. It was a glaring mistake, one that cost Galarraga his perfect game. Instead of hiding or deflecting, Joyce watched the replay, saw his error, and immediately sought out Galarraga. With tears in his eyes, he admitted his mistake and apologized. This heartfelt moment of humility and sincerity transformed the incident from a bitter disappointment into a touching example of sportsmanship. Contrast this with Tiger Woods' response to his 2009 scandal. Instead of a swift, heartfelt apology, Woods issued a vague, prepared statement and retreated from public view. His reluctance to address his mistakes openly and promptly only fueled the media frenzy and prolonged his personal and professional turmoil. A sincere and quick admission might have spared him some of the intense public scrutiny and helped restore his image faster. Similarly, consider the contrasting fates of baseball players Jason Giambi and Mark McGuire. Jambi immediately admitted his steroid use, earning public forgiveness and moving forward with his career. McGuire, on the other hand, waited five years to come clean, damaging his reputation and delaying his acceptance by fans and peers. In our personal lives, the power of immediate and emphatic apologies is just as significant. Take the story of Anne, a successful executive who carried the weight of a single mistake, a kiss with a coworker, hidden from her husband for six years. When she finally confessed, it was painful and difficult, but it led to an outpouring of forgiveness and a more authentic, open relationship. Admitting faults isn't just about clearing the air. It's about demonstrating humility and respect for others. Ronald Reagan, known as the great communicator, often diffused situations with his quick wit and willingness to admit mistakes. During a challenging time in his presidency, he joked about his administration's disarray earning laughs and easing tensions. The lessons are clear. Owning up to our mistakes promptly and sincerely not only repairs relationships, but also builds trust and respect. When we delay or avoid admitting faults, we risk escalating the situation and damaging our credibility. So, whether in the public eye or our personal lives, let's remember the power of those two simple words, I'm sorry. Embrace the courage to admit mistakes quickly and emphatically 
and watch how it can turn a moment of failure into a story of redemption and grace. Successful leaders are always initiators, writes leadership expert John C. Maxwell in his flagship book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. He recalls a time when beginning in a friendly way was crucial. Freshly hired to lead a troubled church in Lancaster, Ohio, Maxwell faced Jim Butts, an influential and intimidating lay leader known for his maverick behavior. Maxwell, just 25 years old, arranged a meeting with the 65-year-old Jim in his office. Instead of an awkward confrontation, Maxwell began with humility, acknowledging Jim's influence and expressing a desire to collaborate. He proposed they meet weekly to discuss issues and make decisions together. While I'm the leader here, Maxwell said, I'll never take any decision to the people without first discussing it with you. I really want to work with you. We can do a lot of great things together at this church, but the decision is yours. Jim's initial silence was telling. He left the office, took a long drink at the water fountain, and finally, with tears in his eyes, gave Maxwell a bear hug. You can count on me to be on your side, Jim said. Maxwell's friendly approach had transformed potential conflict into a strong alliance. Friendliness begets friendliness. We are more inclined to see things from another's perspective when we have friendly feelings toward them. Conversely, if someone is brusque or uninterested, we tend to mirror that sentiment, creating obstacles to effective communication. David Shainer, in The Seven Arts of Change, shares a powerful example of this principle. He was teaching Ki Aikido at the Aspen Snowmass Academy of Martial Arts, where Sheriff Dick Keenast and his deputies were among his students. Keenast believed in civility and compassion in law enforcement, a philosophy put to the test by Deputy Bob Broadus. Broadus, known for his calm demeanor, faced a critical situation at the Woody Creek Tavern, where an armed man was holding patrons hostage. Instead of escalating the situation, Broadus approached unarmed, spoke calmly to the man, and empathized with his frustration. This friendly approach diffused the situation, leading the gunman to surrender peacefully. This story illustrates the power of starting interactions on a friendly note, even in high-stress situations. Whether writing an email or meeting someone for the first time, a civil, courteous tone can pave the way for positive outcomes. Abraham Lincoln's wisdom, I do not like that man. I must get to know him better, emphasizes the importance of understanding and friendliness in building relationships. In today's fast-paced world, creating genuine connections can be challenging, especially through digital communication. Entrepreneur Gary Vaynerchuk in the Thank You Economy <laughs> advises business leaders to think like small town shop owners, focusing on building authentic relationships. This means treating every interaction as though you were speaking to someone face-to-face -face with the same level of respect and friendliness. The Sun and the Wind Fable, where the sun's gentle warmth wins over the wind's fury, is a timeless reminder that gentleness and friendliness are more effective than force and aggression. In an age that often rewards loudness and speed, the real value lies in engagement built on mutual benefit and trust, starting with a friendly approach. Gary Vaynerchuk notes, engagement has to be heartfelt or it won't work. People can easily spot insincerity and only genuine friendliness fosters lasting connections. Winning friends and influencing people begins with a simple but profound principle, always start in a friendly way. Access affinity, like, friend, follow, share. In today's digital age, connections often exist long before the first hello. Back in Carnegie's time, friendships were built on face-to-face -face meetings and shared conversations. You met someone, you talked, and you found common ground, paving the way to deeper connections. Today, people follow you on Twitter, join your Facebook groups, or like your latest YouTube video before you've even met. Numerous threads of affinity form in the digital ether before any real-world encounter. With every like and thumbs up, we exchange silent agreements and disagreements, forming alliances based solely on shared interests. Points of affinity and dissonance emerge, guiding us towards those we resonate with most. This natural gravitation can significantly bolster the foundation for lasting relationships and influence. This isn't about the law of attraction, where merely thinking about having many friends translates into reality. Instead, it's about what John C. Maxwell calls the law of magnetism. 
Effective leaders are always on the lookout for good people, Maxwell notes. Consider this. Do you know who you're looking for right now? What qualities do your ideal employees or friends possess? Whether they're aggressive and entrepreneurial or natural leaders, the key is that like attracts like. Who you attract is determined by who you are. In the digital realm, we can now ascertain affinity before approaching someone. Likes and follows act as preludes to influence. When someone joins your Facebook group, follows your blog, or comments on your website, they're saying yes to you, positioning you in a powerful stance for influence. When someone genuinely says yes, they're open and receptive, a state that fosters agreement. So, stacking yeses from the beginning of an interaction, even if they're about minor things, sets a positive tone that can lead to larger agreements. Starting from yes is crucial. We have an immense opportunity to connect positively with people interested in who we are and what we say. Organizations can harness this power effectively, as illustrated by Microsoft's strategy with Windows 7. After the dismal reception of Windows Vista, Microsoft needed to get users on board with Windows 7. It started with yes. By engaging fans through I'm a PC videos and incorporating user feedback from social media, Microsoft built a positive campaign. They even invited fans to host Windows 7 launch parties, turning them into influencers and advocates. This yes-based strategy turned potential rejection into widespread acceptance. Microsoft's fans felt valued and important, transforming them into enthusiastic promoters of Windows 7. Starting with yes cultivates affinity, but maintaining it requires empathy. We must continuously view interactions from others' perspectives to understand the true value of our shared interests. Ignoring what others want and bombarding them with our pitch often leads to rejection. Social media guru Chris Brogan warns against this, emphasizing the importance of meaningful, permission-based interactions over a blizzard of business. In essence, offering what people want in your communication earns their trust and positions you to confidently present your ideas, products, or causes. This principle applies beyond the digital world. Consider a newspaper company faced with rising costs. Instead of delivering replacement papers for weather-damaged ones, they offered refunds. The way they communicated this policy change made all the difference. A letter beginning with acknowledgement and empathy likely would have been better received than one starting with a negative announcement. There are two kinds of agreement today. The traditional one involves dialogue and shared opinions. The second, more prevalent in the digital age, is based on shared likes and affinities. Establishing this early affinity is a modern form of agreement that paves the way for future yeses. Access affinity early and often to build connections and influence effectively. Surrender the credit, the power of letting others shine. A student from Dale Carnegie Training in Australia shared a story that serves as a vivid reminder of the consequences when we fail to acknowledge this vital principle. My business partner and I ran one of Brisbane's largest IT retailers. With eight stores, over 60 employees, and an annual turnover exceeding $10 million, our operation seemed unstoppable. Yet, despite my partner's significant contributions and easygoing nature, I believed our success was solely my doing. I thought my way was the only way to run the business, and I made every disagreement and argument I had to win, disregarding my partner's feelings and ideas. In the end, I won all the arguments and had my way, but I lost the partnership and eventually the company. Reflecting on this, after learning about the importance of sharing credit, I realized how wrong I had been. Today, I always ask my partners about their goals before setting my own and consider what I can do to help them achieve those goals. The perils of claiming credit. Seeking recognition for our efforts is natural, but insisting on taking all the credit alienates people and diminishes our influence. The worst quality in a leader, according to followers, is taking credit for successes while blaming others for failures. This self-centered behavior quickly drives people away. Nobody wants to follow a leader who doesn't acknowledge their contributions. Conversely, everyone wants a leader who recognizes and appreciates their efforts. Giving away credit is a magical multiplier, writes Forbes blogger August Turok. This principle applies in both business and personal relationships. Genuine gratitude and the willingness to share credit can transform relationships 
and foster success. The Sea of Galilee versus the Dead Sea. Tarak shares a poignant homily that illustrates this point well. The Sea of Galilee is teeming with life because it gives away its water, while the Dead Sea is lifeless because it keeps everything for itself. Like the Dead Sea, when we hoard success and recognition, we turn our lives into a barren wasteland. Sharing credit can't be a covert strategy for seeking the spotlight. It must stem from genuine confidence and a desire to uplift others. Watch any awards show and you'll see winners thanking everyone who helped them succeed. These acceptance speeches are not just protocol. They reflect a fundamental truth about success. It's a collective effort. Cultivating a grateful attitude. To be successful, it's often said, you must surround yourself with successful people. But there's a better way. Seek success for those who are already your friends. By helping your friends succeed, you create a network of people who want to see you succeed as well. Surrendering credit is about cultivating gratitude in your relationships and putting others' success first. It's about recognizing that your achievements are intertwined with those of others. Mark Twain understood this well, as demonstrated in a humorous anecdote involving a conversation with Henry Irving. Twain didn't mind letting Irving tell a story that he had originally invented because the joy of the story was more important than who got the credit. Reciprocity, the key to successful relationships. In relationships, giving without expecting anything in return fosters a spirit of reciprocity. True friends look for ways to repay each other doubling the joy and having the sorrow. Imagine this spirit spreading throughout a company or community, leading to greater collaboration and success. In the long run, no one remembers who had the idea first or who spoke up initially. What people remember is magnanimity. Paradoxically, the more you surrender credit, the more memorable and influential you become. The Reagan example. President Ronald Reagan exemplified this principle. He aimed to restore Americans' belief in themselves, putting the nation's success above his own legacy. A plaque above his Oval Office desk read, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. Reagan's leadership was marked by a constant surrender to the greater good, elevating others and fostering progress through unconventional methods. His approach demonstrates that true success isn't about personal accolades, but about partnerships and collective advancement. By surrendering the credit, we cultivate an environment where everyone thrives, transforming both our personal and professional lives. Engage with empathy. We've all discussed the heartbreak of Armando Galarraga's almost perfect game, shattered by a glaring umpire error on what should have been the final play. Replay footage captures the rapid shift on Galarraga's face from joy to shock. The crowd's cheers abruptly halt, replaced by an eerie silence, and soon, loud boos and angry shouts fill the stadium. Galarraga was unjustly deprived of a perfect game, one of the most coveted achievements in pitching. It's especially frustrating given that he wasn't a star expected to reach such heights. He was an average pitcher with an equal tally of wins and losses. This might have been his only shot at baseball immortality, and it was snatched away. Who could blame him for wanting to lash out at the umpire to demand justice? Even the umpire, Jim Joyce, admitted after the game that he'd understand if Galarraga had confronted him aggressively. But there's another, more profound layer to this story. More unforgettable than Galarraga's lost perfection or Joyce's subsequent remorse was the pitcher's response to the stolen achievement. His reaction to the injustice resonated worldwide. In an ESPN interview after the game, Galarraga admitted he didn't know what the call would be. He was focused on catching the ball and securing the out. While he was disappointed, he conceded that the runner might have been safe. The pressure of the moment meant he relied on the umpire's calm judgment. After the game, Galarraga watched the replay and realized a perfect game had been taken from him. Yet, when he spoke to Joyce, he said, I know nobody is perfect. He saw Joyce's regret and faced a choice, tear him down or empathize. Galarraga chose empathy, offering Joyce a hug to ease his guilt. This wasn't a rehearsed act for the cameras. Galarraga was genuinely disappointed and genuinely empathetic. Throughout the post-game interview, he displayed nobility and humility, never portraying the umpire as a villain. He exemplified humility and perspective, the roots of empathy.
In a world obsessed with self-promotion and leverage, we rarely consider how someone else might feel in any situation. No one in sports would have blamed Galarraga for criticizing the umpire on national television. No one would have objected if he had used an interview to tarnish Joyce's reputation. Yet, Galarraga did none of that. His comments focused on Joyce's feelings and acknowledged that nobody is perfect. This reaction is extraordinary because it's so rare. Intriguingly, Galarraga secured a more memorable place in sports history with his response to losing the perfect game than he would have by achieving it. Those who engage others with such distinction are on the path to significant influence. When dealing with someone, always ask, how would I feel if I were in their shoes? Gerald S. Nirenberg wrote, Cooperativeness in conversation is achieved when you show that you consider the other person's ideas and feelings as important as your own. We often critique world leaders easily solving problems from the sidelines. Rarely do we see people saying, I can't imagine the pressure you're under with the weight of a country on your shoulders. I can't imagine the sleepless nights wondering if you made the right decision. By considering another's perspective, you become sympathetic to their feelings and ideas. You can genuinely say, I don't blame you for feeling this way. If I were in your position, I'd feel the same. This rare phrase can stop people in their tracks, grab their attention, and make them more receptive to your ideas. Most people seek someone who will listen and empathize with their situation, regardless of its scale. If you can do that, you're giving a gift that can brighten their day, even their week or month. One man took a Dale Carnegie course and shared how a nurse's genuine interest profoundly impacted his life. Martin Ginsburg, who grew up poor with a single mother on welfare, was alone in a hospital for orthopedic surgery on Thanksgiving. His mother had to work, leaving him crushed by loneliness. He hid under his covers and cried. A young student nurse heard him sobbing, sat on his bed, and wiped away his tears. She shared her own loneliness, having to work and miss her family's Thanksgiving. She asked Martin to have dinner with her. He agreed. She returned with two trays of Thanksgiving dinner, and they talked for hours. Though she was supposed to finish work at 4 p.m., she stayed until 11 p.m. when he fell asleep. Many Thanksgivings have come and gone since then, Ginsburg writes, but I always remember that one and the warmth and tenderness of a stranger that made it bearable. Today, there's little excuse for misunderstanding another's perspective. Many of us broadcast our lives, seeking significance or sympathy. By taking time to understand someone's current circumstances, you avoid making assumptions. Every second spent understanding another's perspective is well spent if that person matters to you. Empathy isn't a natural trait. We must cultivate it. Various factors influence our responses, upbringing, faith, economic status, career. These mix with emotions to shape how we engage with others. But by letting our personal experiences shape our perceptions of others, we can influence our words and actions significantly. Imagine the personal barriers you could bridge at work, home, or with friends if you always responded graciously to mistakes and disputes. What treatment would you receive? What perception would others have of you? Empathy isn't a networking tactic. It's a pathway to meaningful human connections. It's Galarraga, sacrificing his right to berate Joyce and etching his name into sports history. This is the undeniable power of a gracious, understanding approach. Imagine a world where every action, every decision, resonates with the echo of noble motives. A world where the desire to do good, to uplift others, and to stand for what is right forms the very fabric of our interactions. It's a world where we're not just driven by self-interest, but by a deeper yearning to leave a positive mark on the world, to make a difference that transcends our individual lives. From the tales of childhood heroes and heroines who capture our imaginations, to the real-life stories of leaders like Lord Northcliffe and John D. Rockefeller Jr., who appealed not just to pragmatism, but to the nobility inherent in human nature, we find inspiration. They understood that beneath our daily concerns for productivity and profit lies a profound desire to be respected, to protect our loved ones, and to uphold values that speak to our humanity. Consider Sarah's dilemma with the coach company. A sudden price hike threatened to disrupt plans. Yet instead of responding in anger, she chose a different path. 
she appealed to Peter's sense of fairness and respect, invoking the company's initial promise and the trust they sought to uphold. In doing so, she didn't just resolve a logistical issue. She affirmed Peter's integrity and restored a sense of trust. This approach isn't just about solving problems. It's about recognizing and honoring the nobility within others. It's about saying, I believe in you and inviting them to rise to their best selves. It's what drives movements like the Not For Sale campaign, where David Batstone's revelation sparked a crusade against modern day slavery, harnessing outrage into action and appealing to the inherent goodness that compels us to protect the vulnerable. In our interconnected digital age, where information flows freely and decisions can ripple globally in an instant, appealing to noble motives isn't just a strategy, it's a moral imperative. It's about using platforms like social media, not just for promotion, but to rally humanity around causes that matter. Amy Martin's response to the Japanese tsunami reminds us that amidst the noise of marketing and media, there lies a deeper call to connect, to help, to embody the best of what it means to be human. So, as we navigate a world often driven by transactions, let us not forget the power of appealing to noble motives. Let us celebrate the inherent dignity in every person we encounter, recognizing that by doing so, we elevate ourselves and our shared aspirations. Whether in business, advocacy, or everyday interactions, the ability to inspire and move others begins with recognizing and appealing to the nobility that resides within us all. Imagine a journey where selling cotton became a crusade akin to rallying troops for a grand cause. Back in the 1970s, cotton faced a crisis akin to a fading star in a world dazzled by synthetics. Polyester ruled the closets, promising wrinkle-free perfection, while cotton lingered at a meager third of the market. But cotton didn't surrender. Instead, it rewrote its narrative. Enter the slogan that sparked a revolution. Cotton, the fabric of our lives. It wasn't just a marketing pitch. It was a call to reconnect with tradition, comfort, and authenticity. Celebrities adorned in cotton proclaimed its virtues like gospel, transforming mere fiber into a symbol of personal comfort and timeless elegance. Apple, too, understood the power of storytelling when it unveiled the Macintosh in that iconic Super Bowl ad. A hammer-wielding athlete smashing through conformity symbolized liberation from the Orwellian norm. It wasn't just about computers. It was about sparking creativity and individuality in a world dominated by bland uniformity. Then there's Tom's Shoes, a simple idea born from a traveler's observation in a far off land. Blake Mykoski didn't just start a shoe company. He launched a movement. For every pair sold, a child in need received a pair. A tangible story of compassion and impact that resonated far beyond footwear. These stories aren't just about products. They're about people. They're about connecting on a deeper level where commerce meets compassion and innovation meets inspiration. From the cotton fields to Silicon Valley, from charitable deeds to personal struggles, each tale reveals a truth. When we share our journeys, we invite others to share theirs. In today's digital age, the tools to share are abundant. From live streams of surgeries to heartfelt updates on battling illness, transparency has become a currency of connection. It's not just about marketing. It's about forging meaningful relationships where personal and professional blend seamlessly. So, what's your story? Are you weaving Cotton's comeback, smashing conformity like Apple, or championing a cause like Tom's? Whether in business or life, sharing your journey isn't just a narrative. It's a legacy in the making. It's about creating touch points of commonality that bind us together in a tapestry of shared experiences and aspirations. In the end, our journeys are not solitary paths, but interconnected stories waiting to be told. When your journey becomes our journey, the possibilities are limitless. Throw down a challenge, they say. It's not just about setting a goal. It's about igniting a spark, a clash that sharpens edges and brings out the best. Think of Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. Their rivalry wasn't just about basketball. It was a collision of wills a canvas for greatness to emerge. They battled fiercely on the court, each defining the other, pushing themselves to unimaginable heights. Competition, like iron sharpening iron, isn't quiet or polite. It's the raucous symphony of effort and determination, the pulse that drives progress. 
Take Microsoft and AOL in their epic clash, where competition birthed innovation that reshaped our digital landscape. They fought tooth and nail, yet in that tumultuous dance, they pushed boundaries and transformed industries. But challenges aren't just for titans of industry or sports legends. They're woven into the fabric of everyday life, from Teddy Roosevelt's defiant struggle against illness to Sean King's audacious bid to help Haitian orphans. These challenges galvanize us, define us, urging us to confront adversity head on and emerge stronger. In the digital age, challenges take on new forms, like Coke's viral campaign daring people not to smile, or Twit Change rallying celebrities to raise funds through social media. These challenges aren't just about achieving goals. They're about forging connections, sparking joy, and making an impact that resonates far beyond. So throw down a challenge, dare to disturb the status quo, ignite passions and awaken potential. Because in the clash of ideas and efforts, in the crucible of competition, lies the power to inspire, to innovate, and to change the world. In his timeless book, Leadership is an Art, Max Dupree eloquently stated, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. The last is to say thank you. In between, the leader is a servant. This assertion often leads to the misconception that we should deliver bad news up front to get it out of the way. However, especially in today's world where bad news spreads instantaneously, this approach can be counterproductive. Imagine starting a conversation with a negative tone, like the opening act of a tragedy. Faces drop, shoulders slump, and morale plummets. This negative ripple can spread through an entire organization or relationship, creating an atmosphere of defensiveness and resistance. Instead, beginning with sincere appreciation sets a positive tone, making the recipient more open to your message. Consider Sanjeev Ekbode's experience. After a mishap with a home warranty repair, he could have lashed out in frustration. Instead, he calmly thanked the representative for their prompt service before explaining the issue. This positive approach led to swift resolution and a waived service fee. Had he started with anger, the outcome might have been different. This technique, though simple, is challenging to master. Our brains are wired to focus on negative events, a survival mechanism from our ancestral past. Neuroscientists have shown that we are more sensitive to bad news than good, which skews our perception of reality and affects our interactions with others. This negativity bias extends to our impressions of people, often overshadowing their positive traits. During critical conversations, our focus on the negative can dominate, leading us to highlight problems rather than possibilities. This negative focus not only affects our performance, but also triggers defensive reactions in our listeners, who may tune out any constructive feedback. To counteract this, we must train ourselves to focus on the positive. By acknowledging and appreciating the value of those we interact with, we set a foundation for open and constructive communication. Robert Sutton, in his book, Good Boss, Bad Boss, recounts how a battalion commander's respectful and constructive feedback left a lasting positive impact on his soldiers. When leaders start with positive, genuine praise, they create a receptive environment for addressing more challenging issues. Trent Lorcher, a basketball coach, exemplified this when he praised his team's effort despite a loss, leading to a productive practice session focused on improvement rather than blame. Organizations can institutionalize this approach. For example, Andres Navarro's three-for-one rule at Sonda requires employees to identify three positive traits in a colleague before offering any criticism. This method fosters a culture of appreciation and constructive feedback. Effective communication, especially when addressing difficult topics, involves genuine praise, smooth transitions, and constructive advice. Avoid using but after praise, as it negates the positive statement. Instead, use and, followed by actionable advice. Starting with appreciation can transform interactions, making employees more productive, vendors more cooperative, and personal relationships more harmonious. Acknowledge your baggage. Beth was a high-flying executive at a Fortune 100 company, beloved by her bosses and admired by her team. Yet, she found herself locked in a relentless feud with Harvey, a colleague heading another division. 
In this corporate battleground, Beth's vindictive streak was in full swing. Desiring to be a better leader, Beth turned to Marshall Goldsmith, the esteemed executive coach and author of What Got You Here, Won't Get You There. Through his guidance, Beth realized that despite her widespread respect, her behavior towards Harvey was tarnishing her reputation. The path to redemption lay in negotiating a truce, and that required something particularly challenging, admitting her own faults. This was no easy feat. Admitting mistakes to the very person they've impacted can feel like stepping into a lion's den. Tensions run high, competition is fierce, and vulnerability seems like a perilous move. However, such moments offer the most powerful opportunities for resolution through the simple act of acknowledging your mistakes first. So what did Beth say? Harvey, I've received a lot of feedback and there's much I'm proud of. However, I recognize there's room for improvement. I've been disrespectful to you, to the company, and to its traditions. Please accept my apologies. There is no excuse for this behavior. Harvey's reaction? His eyes welled up with tears. He confessed his own dishonorable behavior and pledged to work with Beth towards a better future. A long-standing, bitter turf war was diffused with a heartfelt admission of mistakes. When someone begins a difficult conversation by humbly acknowledging their own faults, it becomes much easier to discuss grievances without defensiveness. Dale Carnegie, a master communicator, utilized this tactic effectively. By sharing his own failures as, as a mentor and coach, he opened readers up to the idea that discussing faults could be constructive. Leaders often struggle with this approach due to a critical challenge, admitting their fallibility. Despite understanding the inherent value of this, many find it difficult to put into practice, yet research supports its effectiveness. A study by the Institute for Health and Human Potential involving 35,000 participants found that freely admitting mistakes was the trait most strongly linked to career advancement. Acknowledging mistakes is akin to the first step in a 12-step program. It's both the hardest and most crucial. Until we accept accountability, we cannot learn from our errors, use them as stepping stones, or build trust. To leave the road of continual failure, a person must first utter the three most difficult words to say, I was wrong. He has to open his eyes, admit his mistakes, and accept complete responsibility for his current wrong actions and attitudes. Portia Nelson eloquently captures this process in her autobiography in five short chapters. What starts as a pit of despair evolves into detachment from the problem until we accept responsibility. This realization allows us to find quicker solutions and eventually avoid the pitfalls altogether, shifting us from proficient problem solvers to individuals who act more proficiently. Beyond personal growth, admitting mistakes fosters invaluable trust with colleagues, customers, friends, family, and community members. Goldsmith emphasizes that no one expects perfection, but when we err, they expect us to own up to it. Being wrong is an opportunity, an opportunity to show what kind of person and leader we are. How well you own up to your mistakes makes a bigger impression than how you revel in your successes. Discussing our mistakes humanizes us, making it easier for others to relate. They feel understood and in this mental space are more open to our advice. This principle is universally applicable because we all err, providing a wealth of stories to use when trying to ease someone's discomfort. Always pair these stories with constructive advice, not outright criticism. Carnegie illustrated this with his niece and assistant, Josephine. By reflecting on his own past mistakes and her inexperience, he gently guided her towards better judgment without criticism. You've made a mistake, Josephine, he would say, but it's no worse than many I've made. Judgment comes with experience, and you're better than I was at your age. I've been guilty of many silly things myself, so I have little inclination to criticize you. But don't you think it would have been wiser if you had done so-and-so? By admitting your own mistakes, you soften the approach and avoid triggering defensiveness. When you acknowledge your baggage, trust builds naturally. In the early morning hours of his presidency, Calvin Coolidge awoke in his hotel suite to the sight of a cat burglar rifling through his belongings. Coolidge quietly addressed the thief, asking him not to take a particular charm attached to his watch chain. When the burglar read the engraving, revealing that it was a gift to Calvin Coolidge, Speaker of the House, he realized 
who he was dealing with. Coolidge then calmly identified himself as the president, persuaded the burglar to return the charm, and engaged him in a gentle conversation. Discovering that the young man and his college roommate were in dire financial straits, Coolidge handed him $32 from his own wallet, calling it a loan, and advised him to leave the same way he had come to avoid the Secret Service. This story encapsulates a powerful leadership principle, calling out mistakes quietly. Direct confrontation often breeds resentment, but a gentle, indirect approach can lead to remarkable outcomes. Leaders have an invaluable tool at their disposal, modeling the behavior they wish to see. John Maxwell refers to this as the law of the picture in his book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. He illustrates it with the story of Dick Winters, a World War II platoon leader who demonstrated courage and led by example under heavy fire, inspiring his men to follow suit and secure victory. But what if modeling behavior isn't an option? The authors of Influencer suggest several strategies, identify key influencers within the group and encourage them to adopt the desired behavior. Create a community-focused approach to foster peer pressure in a positive direction. Modify resources or environments to make the new behavior easier to adopt. Consider the post-World War II scenario where returning soldiers and women workers clashed in restaurant kitchens. William Foote White, a professor at the University of Chicago, observed the hostile interactions and proposed a simple yet effective solution, a metal spindle for organizing orders. This small change revolutionized communication, reduced conflicts, and improved service, showing how indirect methods can profoundly influence behavior. Sometimes, the best response to a mistake is not punishment, but an opportunity for redemption. Legendary test pilot Bob Hoover once faced a life-threatening situation due to a mechanic's error. Instead of scolding the mechanic, Hoover entrusted him with servicing his plane again, demonstrating confidence in the young man's ability to learn from his mistake. This approach builds trust and encourages personal growth. In an era where authenticity is highly valued, addressing mistakes quietly and constructively helps maintain respect and fosters a positive environment. Leaders should aim to uplift individuals, guiding them back to confidence and competence. By handling mistakes with grace and understanding, leaders can inspire loyalty and foster a culture of continuous improvement. Hash, ask questions instead of giving direct orders. In the military, orders are a part of everyday operations. You're told what to do and expected to follow without question. However, when Captain D. Michael Abrashoff took command of the USS Benfold, a guided missile destroyer, he knew that this approach wouldn't suffice. The Benfold was struggling. Morale was low and the crew was just waiting to get through their service. On top of that, the previous commander hadn't been popular, leaving Abrashoff under intense scrutiny. Abrashoff, in his first sea command, realized he needed a different approach to turn things around. He discovered his crew was smart and full of good ideas, but no one had ever listened to them. So instead of issuing orders, Abrashoff decided to listen. He interviewed five crew members daily until he had talked to all 310 of them. What he found out was eye-opening. The crew spent an excessive amount of time on tedious chores, like painting the ship six times a year. Abrashoff changed the fasteners that caused rust and used a special paint process, cutting down the need to paint to once every two years. This freed up time for more valuable training. He also learned that many sailors were in the Navy to pay for college, so he arranged for SAT testing and advanced placement courses on the ship. Recognizing the tough backgrounds many came from, he included their families in their lives through birthday cards and letters of praise. I wanted to link our goals, Abrashoff wrote, so that they would see improving Benfold as an opportunity to apply their talents and give their jobs a real purpose. The result? Morale soared. The crew was more willing to push boundaries, and the Benfold achieved some of the highest rankings in the Navy. Abrashoff's strategy of asking questions rather than giving orders led to remarkable improvements. Had he simply issued directives, it's unlikely the ship would have seen such transformation. Asking questions made the crew feel valued and stimulated their creativity. People are more inclined to follow a path if they've helped shape it. Similarly, in the corporate world, Bill Marriott Jr., 
of Marriott International was known for his habit of asking questions during his visits to hotels. He would often ask frontline employees, what do you think? To combat the tendency of avoiding bad news and encourage honest feedback. This approach made employees feel involved and led to better management practices. Despite the proven benefits, many leaders hesitate to ask questions, fearing it may seem inefficient or uncertain. However, this mindset overlooks the potential for better solutions and increased engagement from the team. For instance, Ian McDonald, a general manager in Johannesburg, faced a seemingly impossible order. Instead of demanding faster work, he asked his team for ideas on how to meet the deadline. The team responded with innovative solutions, and they successfully completed the order on time. Performance reviews also benefit from this approach. Employees often know their strengths and weaknesses. By incorporating self-appraisal and asking questions about their goals and areas for improvement, reviews become more constructive and less confrontational. Questions can be powerful in any medium even in a quick text or tweet. They create a dialogue that leads to better outcomes and makes everyone feel part of the process. So wouldn't you rather be asked a question than given an order? In the summer of 1941, Sergeant James Allen Ward performed an act of sheer bravery that earned him the Victoria Cross. High above the Zuder Z, in the midst of a treacherous flight, Ward crawled out onto the wing of his Wellington bomber to extinguish a fire. Secured only by a rope, he managed to snuff out the flames and return safely to the cabin. His audacity didn't go unnoticed. Winston Churchill, ever the admirer of daring exploits, invited the shy New Zealander to 10 Downing Street. In the presence of the formidable Prime Minister, Ward found himself at a loss for words. Observing the young hero's discomfort, Churchill offered a kind remark. You must feel very humble and awkward in my presence, to which Ward meekly agreed. Churchill replied, then you can imagine how humble and awkward I feel in yours. Churchill's words transformed Ward's silence into a moment of dignity. He mitigated fault, allowing Ward to save face and recognize his true heroism. Too often we fail to extend this simple act of grace. We criticize harshly, belittle publicly, and undermine the confidence of those around us. Yet, offering a considerate word, acknowledging effort, or addressing mistakes privately can significantly alleviate the sting of failure. This consideration is crucial for leaders. Fear of failure stifles creativity and innovation. When individuals know they risk public humiliation or harsh criticism, they are less likely to take risks, share ideas, or think outside the box. Yet, failure is an inevitable part of any endeavor. Even prestigious publications like the Harvard Business Review acknowledge this, dedicating an entire issue to understanding and learning from failure. A poignant example comes from a large media company where an executive was tasked with launching a new magazine. Despite her best efforts, the publication failed. The CEO, rather than reprimanding her, publicly commended her courage and the collective support behind the decision. This act of acknowledging shared responsibility and providing a psychological safety net allowed the executive to maintain her dignity and learn from the experience. This approach, described by Robert Sutton as forgive and remember, helps individuals accept accountability while managing the emotional burden of failure. It's a vital strategy for any leader as it fosters resilience and continued contribution. Studies support this notion. Research by Fiona Lee, Amy Edmondson and Stefan Tomke revealed that in environments where managers embraced mistakes as part of the learning process, employees were more willing to experiment and ultimately became more proficient with new systems. Resilience, the ability to bounce back from failure, is a trait cultivated by supportive environments. Martin P. Seligman, a pioneer in positive psychology, emphasizes that resilience determines how individuals respond to setbacks. Military recruits, for instance, develop resilience through constant exposure to challenging situations and a mindset that mistakes are part of the journey. Donovan Campbell, a veteran and author, highlights this perspective. In school, you're rewarded for not making mistakes. In the military, you learn that mistakes are inevitable and sometimes failure is beyond your control. This acceptance fosters a mature approach to failure. Creating a supportive environment involves acknowledging that failure happens, encouraging open dialogue, separating the person from the failure, 
learning from mistakes, and implementing a system that manages risk and failure. These steps, as outlined by Charlene Lee in Open Leadership, help build a culture where innovation thrives. Alberto Alessi, an esteemed designer, views failure as an opportunity for innovation. His company strives to design on the edge of what is possible, knowing that pushing boundaries often leads to failure, but also to significant breakthroughs. Sir Richard Dyson, with his thousands of prototypes, exemplifies this relentless pursuit of innovation despite repeated failures. In today's digital age, mistakes are often magnified and publicized. It's crucial to help others save face, whether in personal interactions or through written communication. A considerate approach can transform a potential embarrassment into a moment of learning and growth. For instance, when a customer mistakenly complains about a competitor's product thinking it's yours, responding graciously and offering a replacement can turn a negative experience into a positive one as practiced by Rubbermaid. Mitigating fault and helping others save face not only preserves their dignity, but also strengthens trust and relationships. By consistently offering this grace, we foster environments where individuals feel valued and empowered to take risks, innovate, and ultimately contribute more effectively. On a bright day in 2010, Best Western launched a Facebook page that became a beacon of positivity. This wasn't just any page, it was dedicated to Wallace Pope, a beloved employee at the Best Western River North Hotel in Chicago. The flood of heartfelt messages that followed was nothing short of remarkable. Guests raved about Wallace's warm smile and welcoming nature. They shared stories of how he transformed their stays into memorable experiences. Wallace makes weary travelers feel like they're coming home. The best thing about the hotel lobby is his smile. My kids asked when we were coming back to see Wallace as soon as we left. Every time I pass him, he has a big smile and something fun to say. He is one of the greatest parts of my visits. These messages weren't just empty praise. They reflected genuine affection and appreciation for a man who had a knack for making people feel special. Wallace Pope, a Chicago native and single dad, was more than a hotel employee. He was a master of human connection. When Wallace was nominated for the Stars of the Industry Award from the Illinois Hotel and Lodging Association, Best Western wanted to ensure he got the recognition he deserved. They created the Wallace Should Win Facebook page, encouraging guests to share their experiences. The page quickly garnered 2,722 visits in the first week, filled with stories lauding Wallace's kindness and his ability to brighten the day of every guest he encountered. Although Wallace didn't win the award, the outpouring of support was more valuable than any plaque. The heartfelt encouragement he received highlighted a powerful truth. Praise and recognition are essential for motivating and improving individuals. Dr. Gerald Graham's research underscores this. In a survey of 1,500 employees, he found that to 58% rarely received praise from their manager, 76% seldom received written thanks, 81% hardly ever received public praise. Yet, these are among the top motivators for employees. This gap in recognition persists even today, despite its proven benefits. Frequent praise leads to higher productivity and overall success in organizations, a fact supported by extensive research from the Gallup organization. We all crave appreciation and acknowledgement. When our efforts are noticed, it affirms our value and motivates us to continue improving. Praise should be sincere, timely, specific, and public whenever possible. Consider Captain A. Brashoff of the USS Benfold, who understood this well. He wrote letters to the parents of his sailors, praising their accomplishments. One such letter had a profound impact on a sailor who had never before received encouragement from his father. This simple act of recognition transformed the young man's self-perception and dedication. Encouragement, unlike praise, doesn't require a specific achievement. It's about believing in someone's potential, regardless of their current performance. It fosters resilience and motivation, helping individuals weather challenges and persist in their efforts. John Carlson, a psychologist specializing in healthy relationships, offers practical advice for fostering an encouraging environment. 1. Prioritize healthy relationships with respect and positive communication. 2. Practice daily encouragement, recognizing every effort and improvement. 
Three, be inclusive in decision-making processes, showing faith in others' judgment. Four, address conflicts promptly to avoid discouraging dialogue. Five, have fun and maintain a positive atmosphere. A story from Clarence M. Jones illustrates the transformative power of encouragement. His son David, labeled as a slow learner due to a car accident, struggled academically. Through consistent encouragement and a fun, supportive approach to learning, David not only improved, but excelled. He went from flunking grades to making the honor roll and winning a citywide science fair prize. This transformation wasn't just about academic success. It was about discovering his potential and believing in himself. Encouragement helped David realize that learning was easy and enjoyable, changing his life trajectory. In conclusion, magnifying improvement through praise and encouragement unlocks potential and fosters growth. Recognizing and celebrating efforts and achievements, no matter how small, can transform lives. Let's strive to be like Wallace, Captain Abershoff, and Clarence M. Jones, champions of encouragement who bring out the best in those around us. Imagine a world where each person you meet is not just seen, but seen through the lens of their highest potential. A world where greatness is not just an expectation, but a welcoming invitation. Benjamin Zander, a maestro of music and mentorship, dared to paint such a world for his students at the conservatory. In his class, the typical fear of grades was replaced with an audacious promise, an A for everyone from day one. But this wasn't a mere gift. It was a challenge wrapped in belief. Write me a letter, Xander urged each student, from the future where you've earned this extraordinary grade. And so began a journey where students weren't just taught notes and rhythms, but were entrusted with their own narrative of success. Take Tucker Doolin, a trombonist whose hesitant brilliance bloomed under Xander's radical faith. In his letter, Tucker shared the triumph of shedding masks and finding his true voice each note a testament to the possibility Xander had seen within him. Xander's approach, coined as giving an A, transcends academia. It's a philosophy that can echo through boardrooms and kitchens alike. Whether it's a waitress, an employer, or even the drivers in traffic, Xander teaches us to give each person a reputation to live up to, not as a burden, but as a beacon of potential. When you treat someone as if they've already achieved greatness, you create a space where that greatness can unfold. Paige and Michelle McCabe's mother understood this magic too. When faced with her daughter's eager plea to be big enough, she didn't dismiss it as childish fancy. Instead, she entrusted Paige with a responsibility tailored to her newfound stature. Overnight, Paige blossomed into the picture of responsibility, proudly choosing her clothes and mastering the morning routine a transformation sparked by the belief that she was capable of more. Xander and McCabe's stories intertwine to reveal a profound truth. People live up to the reputations we give them. By expecting greatness, we inspire greatness. By honoring potential, we unleash it. This isn't just about changing behavior. It's about elevating spirits, unlocking doors, and crafting a world where every individual can flourish. So, the next time you interact with someone, a colleague, a friend, a child. Consider the reputation you're offering them. Are you challenging them to meet your expectations or are you inspiring them to exceed even their own? In a world that often defaults to cynicism, choose the transformative power of belief. Give others a fine reputation to live up to and watch as they rise to meet it, perhaps even surpassing what you thought possible. In the tumultuous aftermath of a bitter strike at a manufacturing company, the atmosphere was thick with resentment and distrust. Management and workers were at odds, their goals seemingly irreconcilable. Yet amidst this discord, an unexpected breakthrough emerged, one that transformed animosity into understanding. Guided by the wisdom of crucial conversations, both sides embarked on a journey of introspection and collaboration. Each group meticulously outlined their aspirations for the company, vividly depicting their hopes on large posters. As they swapped rooms to explore each other's visions, skepticism gave way to astonishment. Despite their deep-seated grievances, their goals resonated in surprising harmony. Profitability, job stability, product excellence, and community impact. This revelation wasn't just a symbolic gesture. It was a pivotal moment. 
it reframed their conflict from a battle of wills to a quest for mutual success. Understanding the shared aspirations, once obscured by distrust, paved the way for a new dialogue, a dialogue grounded in common ground. Why does common ground matter so profoundly? Because it bridges the gap between differences, forging connections that transcend initial discord. Whether in business negotiations, personal interactions, or leadership challenges, finding common ground is not just about compromise. It's about understanding and aligning aspirations. It's about transforming potential adversaries into allies, making collaboration not only possible, but mutually beneficial. Consider Dana White, the UFC president, who inadvertently shared his personal phone number with millions of fans. What could have been a PR disaster became an opportunity for genuine connection. For over 90 minutes, he engaged directly with fans, defying convention to build a bond that strengthened his sports community. His transparency and authenticity resonated deeply, illustrating the power of personal connection in a digital age. In today's interconnected world, the ability to find common ground extends beyond physical presence. It hinges on a genuine desire to understand others, whether they are colleagues, customers, or community members. It's about asking the right questions, listening intently, listen they, and recognizing shared aspirations that can drive meaningful collaboration. As leaders like Yvon Schwinard of Patagonia and innovators at Virgin Group demonstrate, success lies not just in technological prowess, but in fostering genuine human connections. From open office spaces that encourage communication to digital platforms that amplify voices, the Modern Leaders Toolkit includes empathy, transparency, and a relentless pursuit of shared goals. In essence, staying connected on common ground isn't merely a strategy, it's a philosophy an approach to leadership that transcends organizational boundaries and technological advancements. It's about recognizing that every relationship, every interaction, holds the potential to build bridges, inspire change, and create lasting impact. In a world where connectivity is constant and community is key, the path to success isn't just about reaching higher, it's about reaching together, hand in hand, grounded firmly on the common ground we discover and nurture.